Welcome to Beyond the Press Release, a production of Gorecom, in which we take the time to speak with small cap executives after they put out important news. With us today, you can see him, he's smiling on the screen for good reason. Steve McCauley, CEO of Empire, Empire Clinics, trades on the CSC under CBDT and for our friends in the U.S. under EPWCF and even for our friends in Frankfurt under 8EC. For those new to the story, this is an integrated healthcare company serving patients through clinics in both US and Canada with a stated goal of 30 clinics in Canada by the end of 2021. They've already announced a pipeline of 22 clinics. Each location expected to generate between 2.5, $3.6 million in annual revenue. And helping along with that is a great partnership with Rexall. They've also got a leading medical diagnostics lab that's already processing thousands of COVID-19 specimens and developing novel COVID-19 testing protocols. That's going great. And the telemedicine platform, more than just lip service, they just put out 2020 revenue, US dollars, 3.2 million, up about 60% year over year. With that significantly powered up balance sheet with a lot of money coming in. Recently announced a six month pilot program, Pharma Choice, to sell Kai Care saliva test kits. And we know they've got over 900 locations in Canada. On and on, they've done amazing things. Steve, welcome back, man. Great to have you back. Hey, George, thank you. Thank you for the, the kind words in the intro. Uh, it's nice to hear kind of a long list of uh, recent accomplishments uh, and also kind of remind me and all of us that uh, we, we've really done some great things um, over the last six months to really kind of set ourselves up for the growth trajectory and, and all the things that will come with it. So uh, let's let's get at it and just uh, you know share share with our followers um, all the things that have been going on. And, and remember, by the way, I had to cut down that list because if I kept on mentioning everything, everything it would be like a two and a half minute intro. So that was just some of the best. There's more, and I bet you a lot of it'll come up. The the L, the monkey that's finally off uh, your back, the company's back, and the shareholders back are the the 2020 audit numbers are done. Yeah. First of all. How does it feel just to finally have this out of the way? Oh, I mean, it's it's a relief, right? This this has been uh, such an incredible grind. Uh, you know, it just very frustrating delays. You know, and um, you know, we have we are going to figure this out going forward. You know, we we deserve to have our organization structure uh, be you know state of the art, best in the business, best in the industry. So that situations like this don't come up again, and you know we we have resources now to fill the holes with world class people um, in these key roles, you know, like the chief financial officer role and the controller roles that go along with it in the divisions. You know, this time last year we didn't have these resources, and in normal course as a more funded company you would start your audit planning preparation in the fourth quarter of that year. So that by the time you get into January, you're, you're deep into your audit uh, processes already. We just weren't in the position to do that because we didn't have the resources and, and there were still you know, prior accounts payable that had to be taken care of and cleared because no audit firm is going to work um, without their retainers. So, you know, my commitment is to figure that out. We'll have some announcements coming up in, in the next little while. Uh, we won't, we won't wait too long before we really share, um, some of the key steps that we will be taking to not have this happen again. In fairness to you though, if it not, if, if we're not for the two great acquisitions you made in Q4, uh, the, I don't think you would have this problem, right? Because you. Oh no, not at all, not at all. I mean, this is this well, that's is good news. At the end of the day, it happened yeah. because of two major acquisitions. Well, it's two major acquisitions, and and dealing with you know closed travel borders, um, and you know normally when we have these cross border situations, you know we would have auditors, you know, in early lined up to do inventory counts, all the normal sort of things that you can do. You know, we simply had to do this all remotely. And it was a challenge. And then you've got two new private companies coming into a public market environment um, with a lot of catch up to do, you know, quickly. But the, the benefits of those acquisitions 
and the choice to do them in the fourth quarter last year far outweighed some of the, the you know, accounting detriment or detrimental aspects. Yeah, and if you just look, look what those catalysts did for us. It got our stock price and market cap running. Uh, that created the inflow of warrant conversions. That created cash for us now to operate and make decisions in a completely different manner. If those cat growth catalysts did not happen, we likely would not be sitting where we are today. So in hindsight, no about that. No I'll, doubt I'll, about take, that. I'll take those growth catalysts. Um, you know, it's, we're still, you know, small cap ultimately trying to become mid cap company. And you have your ups and downs and bumps in the road. Not everything is perfect all the time. And, uh, but no excuses. We've just got to get better. That's, that's what it comes down to. So we've got to find a way, find the right people, plug the holes where there were holes that we identify and move forward and not let this happen again. But a classic example of short-term pain, <clears throat> long-term. Absolutely. Pain, that's yeah. for sure. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and uh, you know, something that's important I want to discuss here, the intangible part, which is, and rightfully so, there are a lot of shareholders or some shareholders that were going through anxiety and stress through this. Okay? And yeah, cause the boogeyman was, hey, what's going on here? Is there something, yeah. is, there, is there a boogeyman in the closet with the financials? And, you know, there's some real the anxiety and rumors out there. You lived up to your word where you came, uh, you came here a couple of times. You did some solo videos a couple of times. You said, yeah. guys, we don't have any issues. There are not going to be any surprises that come out of this. It's just a volume issue because of everything that happened with the acquisitions. Mm -hmm. Now that that's, uh, now that, now that the, the numbers are out, I think everyone can agree again, Hey, Steve lived up to his word. Uh, and, and, and there weren't any, there wasn't a boogeyman in the closet. So what does that say for when we talk a little bit about what's going to go, ha what's going to happen in 20, 2021 going forward with this all behind us? Yeah. So I, I think, you know, your, your point is, is correct. And again, you know, thank you for the kind words and support. Um, you know, the, the, the financial, the, the revenue numbers and kind of where the expenses landed up, you know, the, you know, the, 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 uh, non-cash items, you know, aside for now, um, is really what we anticipated. You know, we didn't have any uh, surprises that I, uh, you know, th thought came out that, you know, we, we weren't kind of tracking or we, we weren't aware of. And um, it, you, you're right to the extent, it's just the, the difficulties associated with uh, the two new ones coming in. And then, you know, really just dealing with, I will say, just sort of politely, a, a challenging audit. And um, <clears throat> there's no way, you know, w once you're in it, you, you, can't, you can't back out. You can't, you can't step sideways and find a different audit firm to work with. It, it doesn't work that way, right? Once you're started, you, you got to just navigate your way through. Um, you know, everybody's professional and we have to treat everybody that way and we do, but it doesn't mean that we can't push and be firm and, um, and challenge the dialogue and the conversation. And, and that's what we did, particularly as we had to grind through, you know, the last, you know, the last couple of weeks. And I mean, I, mean, I got to thank all of our accounting team. Um, you know, these people were working to, you know, the, the wee hours of the morning every single day and getting back up the next day and getting back at it again um, to get to get this thing right. But, but I love the fact that your leadership came through, uh, you know, we, you, your, your leadership rating was at a hundred percent. And then it, you know, there was a bit of a concern there. We got to talk, but you were honest with everybody. You came on video, you didn't duck and hide and you told everybody that, you know, there wasn't any issues. It was just volume. I love the fact that you've been proven right. Cause I, I think that says a lot about company going forward. Before we talk about the company going forward, let's talk a little bit about the result. And we can't spend too much time on the 2020 result, right, Steve? It's, we're in the first week of July now. By the way, it's uh, well, Canada Day weekend and 4th yeah. of July belated to everybody. I hope you guys have a safe and happy weekend, but it's July now. So this is really rear view. The rear Absolutely. View stuff. Yeah, and, you know, the, and that's what's kind of frustrating for everybody. So, I mean, I've got empathy. You know, we're all sitting here like hanging on, uh, looking for a, you know a financial result that's from six months ago, and frankly, uh, is not a reflection of of kind of who we are today. And <clears throat> hopefully, the followers you know will see. I specifically put 
a lot of emphasis on highlighting subsequent events because there's such a gap in time. Yeah. So our balance sheet, as you can see, dramatically changed. But then even in the first quarter, these subsequent events that I referred to, you know, we paid off debts uh, that were very important to, you know, be cleared. We dealt with uh, more accounts payables. Um, we, the, the balance sheet is in, you know, phenomenal shape compared to where it was before. And you can see even in the first quarter as a subsequent event, we had almost another so almost uh, $6, million, six million dollars more come in at six million dollars a u.s come in right um in terms of in terms of value so you know that that sort of 12 and a half million dollars plus range that i've been talking about before you know now you can everybody can see it flowing through the statements and so as we get through q1 here in the next little bit you'll see the subsequent events flow into the balance sheet and, and again, see dramatic changes in the balance sheet as well. So it's, it's kind of a, a long time ago post-mortem, but hey, you know, the, the, the uh, guidelines um, are the guidelines. We had to get through it. I can't, we can't publish our Q1s until we have that baseline of the year end. Uh, so all of that is now feeding through uh, into the consolidation worksheet that the accountants have done. And that just pumps out the other side, uh, the actual results. So, um, you know, we're gonna be able to have those out um, in very short order. The one thing I want to address in the 2020 results uh, was the net income or the net loss number. Yeah. Because there's, you know, on the operating side, which is the most important side, you actually lowered uh, you, 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 the operating, the, the, let me just go to the, the well, loss the, from operations of 4.5 million compared to 6.1 million the year before. So it really yeah. was a great number. But the net loss number was much bigger. So I would love for you to have a second to explain to people in case they saw that net loss number and saying, wow, the company lost a lot of money. It was actually a double, yeah. it was actually a benefit. Well, it's, it's, it's a really odd one. So we're governed by um, IFRS in terms of our accounting standards. So the International Financial Reporting Standards. We're not reporting as gap accounting. So IFRS treats uh, derivative liabilities um, how you account for leases on your facilities uh, in a different manner than say GAP would do. And so um, each quarter, whether it's the year end or we're doing our own quarters, we have to run um, the Black-Scholes model, which is the, the sophisticated model that really does the calculation of these derivative liabilities and then what has to translate back to the balance sheet and the P&L. We had an interesting situation arise and that is, we issued warrants um, in the fourth quarter. Financing, because you had a major right. financing. We had a major financing, but we also had warrants uh, from pr the prior two years as well. And then we had this anomaly, and that is our stock price shot up and shot up rapidly in the fourth quarter. What the Black Scholes model is doing is just really just calculating the delta between the strike price of the warrants, so the conversion price, and the market price weighted average in the quarter. And that sort of lost opportunity cost is what they're trying to you know, wrap some numbers around. So we saw that as a big spike. It's a non-cash item, uh, doesn't impact the bank account or, or our ability to operate. Now, ironically, what's going to happen Q1, Q2 going forward is we're going to pick up a benefit now uh, from that because we've had a number of warrant conversions take place so those warrants are now gone. They've actually just flushed through the financial statement and they're on our cap table as cash. Uh, so what we're gonna end up doing is getting some form of a gain on derivative liability right. in the first quarter and the second quarter. I don't know what the final amounts are. We haven't um, run the full uh, Black-Scholes model. We'll probably have preliminary updates on that tomorrow. Um, so we're going to get an uh, earnings per share benefit from that same category. It's just a little bit you know, striking when you see it such a large number in the one quarter, but we had very isolated events that took place that under IFRS, IFRS standards, you know, throws out that result. And essentially they're calling it a loss because it, you, you issued the warrants at let's say 10 cents, the stock yeah. price is at you know, a dollar, so it calculates that opportunity cost in the middle saying, well, if you hadn't given these 10 cents to Georgecom, these 10 cents to Warren's Georgecom, you could have got them at a dollar. So this, this goes down as an accounting loss, but it's not operational. 
It's not, not a cash. It's just a paper. And I, I think that's the most important thing for people to understand at home. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. It's, it's, it's measuring that delta um, using a very sophisticated financial model. And now, who would complain, right? Because the stock went from five cents to, I, was, I don't know well, where it was in December, but it, it was on a rocket ride. So I think all yeah, shareholders are exactly. happy with that. Well, I, exactly. And this is why, um, again, sometimes, you know, it can just be a bit frustrating and we have to just do our best to articulate what's taking place and, and why. And so I, I appreciate the opportunity to kind of talk about it at length here. The other thing that we did um, that might help this is uh, in our MD&A, I don't know if uh, people read the MD&A or not, but if you go to um, page 11 on our MD&A, we created a table to help address this kind of visually. And so we created what we called an adjusted EBITDA. And the reason that it's in the MDNA and not the financial statements is the adjusted EBITDA is created under gap accounting. We can't put gap accounting information and IFRS information into the financial statement together. That's a, that's a violation of accounting standards. But we can use it in the MDNA to help describe the differences year over year. So if you haven't looked at that table, I would encourage you to read that table and you can see the impact of same line items, 2018, 2019, 2020, and how that impacts ultimately our, what we're gonna, we're gonna call going forward, our adjusted EBITDA, okay? All right, perfect, Dan. And I love the fact that you went the extra mile there for everyone to, to go reference that. So all that's behind us now, right? Okay. Big weight off the shoulders, big monkey off the back, all that. Let's get back to talking about the good stuff when it comes to Empower, which is got it. growth and operation. So I've got four areas I want I want to go over with you, which is the clinics. And no, you pick the order. Clinics, sure. lab expansion, Kai tests, M&A. Uh, let's start, if it's okay with you, with clinics. Where yeah. are we at? How's that going? Did, did you have to stumble at all because of the audit and all that all that taking place? Or has that been going full steam ahead? So I'd say it's fair to generalize that although we were dealing behind the scenes, uh, generally speaking, all of the growth activities, the operational work, um, the divisions and the things that they're doing have all been taking place. Um, right. And the, the only thing that I would say is, my, less of my time to be available uh, because of having to, you know, stay strong on top of uh, the audit requirements. But we kept kind of the juggling act going and full credit to our divisions, to, to, to Dr. Jordan and Dr. Aviv uh, in Toronto, to uh, Yoshi in Kai Medical, the Sun Valley teams, you know, still grinding away locally in their markets um, and even the group up in Oregon. So, you know, operationally, everybody were doing what they're supposed to do. So we've got updates to catch up on. You know, we've got leases that I've signed over that time period. Um, for I haven't been announced yet because we have announced some. So more yeah, we have announced some, but there's, there's again, behind the scenes, you know, we're, we're still progressing. We're, do, we're right. negotiating terms. Uh, they're, they're getting me back agreements. I'm signing the agreements. Uh, construction has started. Um, construction at Kai Medical is uh, basically almost done now. We're trying to we're trying to pin down kind of a ribbon cutting ceremony uh, date, and um, so again, like there's just such a large effort, collective effort, positive effort taking place at the divisions. So we'll be back on track with more updates on a more regular basis, like we were doing before, and um, so probably look for. Uh, you know, more interviews, uh, more, you know, highlights, say, just in case you had forgotten, this is what our pipeline looks like. And, and here's how they're, they're all progressing. So that our position of having kind of 30 clinics, you know, uh, 30 new locations kind of on the go at various phases of, of that, you know, still with, you know, six months left in 2020, uh, 21, uh, is in my mind, uh, not off track at all. So that's real great news because that was a major distraction. So the fact that you're able, you and the team were able yeah. to keep the ball rolling on the clinics, uh, expansion side for Canada is amazing. 
Yeah, yeah. Like I say that, you know, I've got uh, great faith um, in in the team that we're building on the ground and uh, Jordan and Aviv, you know, they're they're getting better and better all the time. They, they already were talented and smart, um, but they're they're really figuring it out. And, and I've been able to step back more and lean on their leadership uh, to, to deliver this. And, and I think all shareholders uh, need to recognize um, their contributions. And, and I'm, I'm so thrilled to have them on our leadership team. By the way, I'm hoping we're going to have a few ribbon cutting ceremonies, obviously one for the lab expansion, because that sounds like it's going to be done. But safe to say, we may have a couple for the clinics opening up in Ontario when they open and oh yes, flying in, invite shareholders who live in the area or drive for, for, to be there and, and kind of see it all. Yeah, absolutely. You know what? We need to we need to find the time to you know celebrate. Um, you know, with it, it doesn't have to be some you know belated uh, uh, sort of ceremony, but we certainly need to acknowledge. Um, I think it's also important for the local communities that we're serving to recognize that we hey we're here we're here for you as patients. Um, hey, you know, hey, um, you know, pharmacy partner, we're here for your customers to support them uh, in the neighborhoods that you serve um, as we align ourselves together in those communities. So it's more than just um, kind of, you know, acknowledging that we have an opening. I think it's, I, I see it like, you know, PR and marketing within the community because we want patients to know that we exist and that we have primary care physicians, we have paramedical services, we have specialty medical services. Um, coming to their community. Uh, and I just think that's that's big news every time that we do it. And I think it's great for shareholders to, like, I plan to be there, you know, yeah. video, maybe even live video over Twitter or whatever the yeah. case may be. But uh, I think I think that's going to be great for the shareholders as well, just to see it all come into fruition. Yeah, yeah. And, and listen, nothing, nothing pleases me more than to, you know, spend time with shareholders and get introduced. It's, you know, it's obviously been very difficult through the pandemic uh, to connect but I feel like, you know, it, it's progressing finally. And, you know, I'm, I'm double vaccinated already. And, and, you know, so many, you know, people, you know, the numbers in Canada are really ramping up. So um, our concept of getting back to a little bit more on uh, uh, back to normal, I think is coming ahead for us. And I look forward to meeting people, our great followers uh, in person for sure. Kai tests and the MA side have, have, have gotten a bit of a boost as well. So let's talk about Kai test, um, the six month pilot program of Pharma Choice. Yeah, you know, let's Pharma Choice. More, let's put a little more color on that. Pharma Choice, you know, uh, they've been a really good group to work with. Um, they, um, they have a little bit, they're a little bit more nimble, let's say, than some of the other pharmacy partners because we're dealing with big corporate groups versus. Um, Pharma Choice are uh, an organization of independent owner operator pharmacies under this under the same banner. And so what we found is that whether we're talking to them about clinic opportunities or we're talking to them about uh, Kai tests getting on the shelves, um, we just saw their decision making process move more quickly. Um, they provided us a list like name, address, phone numbers, uh, the the, the pharmacist owner themselves of all 935 locations across Canada. That's fantastic. And uh, even further identified um, uh, many hundreds of locations that could potentially have a real estate configuration that could potentially um, be a healthcare center, kind of in the same way that we're, you know, we're, we're doing it elsewhere. So they were ready to go um, with KaiTest.com and get a pilot. Let's get product on the shelf. Um, our bilingual boxes are completed now, and the first um, the first shipments are already in Canada, uh, and we're we're placing those in the hands of other pharmacy groups across the country. Uh, the bilingual printing on our packaging with the Canadian UPC codes um, was a, a, a minimum requirement for Canadian businesses. So, you know, we knew we had to get that done. And uh, so that's done now. And uh, so we're ready to start shipping uh, certain other locations um, product. Um, I don't know yet, you know, which locations are going to take, you know, what quantities, uh, but I do know now that we have the product, um, we can expect to see uh, product on the shelf in certain markets uh, in the very near future would be in, 
That's what I would think. Should, should that be an indication of the kind of activity you guys got going on behind the scenes? Because uh, you know, yeah. this is the Farmer Choice over, like I said, over 900 independent locations. I, I'm going to make the assumption, correct me if I'm wrong, that you must be talking to other big chains as well about this very same thing. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I feel like, you know, we've really, I feel like our thesis here on how we're going to market, there, there's some uniqueness with it. Um, we understand our path uh, or our, let's call it our lane. And we understand the lane of the pharmacy, what matters the most to them and, and what matters the most to us, where their key strengths and attributes lie, where our key strengths and attributes lie. And what we're finding is that the thesis is panning out. We get to a decision um, to get a clinic going more quickly. We do it less expensively. Um, we do the build out more rapidly. Uh, and ultimately, if I think of our long-term return on investment, our long-term return on equity in this go-to-market strategy is substantially better than the concept of just getting standalone new locations ourselves and then trying to build up a patient base. You know, it's not, it's not even close. It's not even close. It's not, not even close. Not even close. And some of these locations, George, um, it's shocking how uh, inexpensive it is for us to open them. I mean, oh, we're that, talking that's music to shareholder ear. <laughs> well, it is because in, in some of these in some of these locations, um, there's uh, the physical clinic has already been built. Whether it was built recently or five years ago uh, is irrelevant. But the working real estate to run a healthcare center is already there. Man. The issue for the pharmacy is it's, they're not, their skill set isn't necessarily um, recruiting and managing physicians and healthcare practitioners. No and, way, because that's a totally which, separate business from running a pharmacy. Totally separate model. Totally separate. But what they do understand is there is a direct correlation to having. Um, healthcare professionals and medical doctors um, in close proximity. So whether that's in the pharmacy, on the pharmacy, beside the pharmacy, and that correlation is driving patient retention and driving prescription traffic to the pharmacy. And that's one of the backbones of the pharmacy industry. So for us to be able to come along in the manner that we are, and again, going back to Dr. Jordan and Dr. Avi for doing such a good job on relationship management, uh, they just know what they're doing. They're doing a great job in recruiting. I, I don't even know what the number is right now of how many physicians we've signed, but it's, it's a lot. And, um, and those are the catalysts to open each new location. So I, I really feel like we're hitting our stride in this formula and I'm not backing away from it. In fact, I'm expanding it by, as again, uh, you know, going to the, the, a great brand like the likes of Pharma Choice and some of the other conversations that we're having because uh, some of the players in Canada are also regional, right? So, and, that's, and the same conversations I've alluded to before is applying down south um, as we're starting to, you know, translate that model back down uh, into the US. And I, I did, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've talked about it on, on your show before that, you know, once we get through a few things in the, you know, first and second quarter with uh, Canadian operations, I will start to turn attention back to US operations for these types of expansions. And that's already been happening behind the scenes. So Steve, uh, audit kind of juggling aside. Yeah. Are you confident? What's your level of confidence in the future of Empower and the, and you know the path that you guys are taking? Is you were you were like a you were like a steam you know, you were a steamroller there, uh, and maybe we haven't seen it because of the because of the audit. But safe to say that the company is stronger than it's ever been, and that your growth prospects are stronger than any time. You know, oh, of point. course. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's a plain and obvious one, right? So, um, you know, our cash position is still very strong. Um, we um, are working within our means. Um, so even though we're doing a lot, um, I'm still being very cautious of our runway and making sure like, as an example, you know, we've got MediSure on the horizon here. Yeah. So 
whilst all of this has been going on, we've also been working with Mario and his team at Medisure on due diligence. And so the, the legal work is happening behind the scenes, the due diligence work is happening behind the scenes, and they've been tremendously supportive. They're tremendously excited. They're hungry to be part of um, you know, the, the story going forward. And I think that they will be a great addition. Right now, due diligence looks very positive. You know, I don't, we haven't seen anything that we would flag as being um, concerning at all. They're very transparent with us and they've been an absolute pleasure to work with so far. So uh, without, without asking for projections or anything like that, should shareholders assume that the Steve McCauley train is going to be back on track, we're going to be seeing you a lot, news, interviews, news, interviews, a lot of biz dev? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Like I need to, I, I you know, in my capacity, uh, need to be on, right? We need to drive uh, the growth opportunities. We're fortunate that we're able to, receive a lot of opportunities coming our way to uh, review. Uh, I certainly don't do them all. I've passed on a number of opportunities uh, because I, I didn't feel they were right at the time or perhaps they were just too big for us to kind of take on right now. And I didn't want to be, I didn't want, I, I'm still going to be risk averse and, and not get so far out in front to find ourselves in trouble. Because I don't want us to ever go backwards on um, how we're doing, right? We, 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 we turn this public company around on very tight times and, and very limited operating budgets uh, where there was tremendous sacrifice um, by everybody involved. We don't want to be back in that position again. So, you know, deals have to, one, work and be accretive, but they also, we have to recognize where we sit today We've got a certain market cap and a certain cash position. Um, I fully anticipate our market cap will be substantially larger going forward. Um, our, our comp set tells us that. Our comp set in the US tells us that we've got tremendous you know, road uh, ahead of us. And so we'll now audit behind us, yeah, we'll get back on it and start pushing um, these uh, you know, next opportunities that are, they're, they're uh, uh, what would be the word I would use? Um, you know, they're, they're percolating just underneath the surface. They're percolating. We've got them. Uh, I'm just going to turn the heat back up on, on these things and uh, see where I can take them. I love that. I love the sounds of that. Um, I want to touch on the U S a little bit. As I, I, if I'm, if I'm going to be premature, then tell me George is premature, but I, I guarantee people are thinking about it saying what's Steve gotten planned for the U S that's a totally different animal. Obviously it's a much bigger market. Uh, but that also come, that also means bigger team, bigger financing, all that kind of stuff. You yeah. know, are you confident that you've got, you've got a beat on, you know, a lot of those resources necessary to get you to where you. Yeah. Can yeah. You know, so we, we certainly have been fortunate to have incredible investment banking support that has shown up over the last sort of, you know, six, nine months. Um, you know, we've been, for whatever reason, been able to maintain really strong liquidity kind of at all times. And I think it's a combination of, you know, us, you know, being active in the market, uh, communicating often and regularly with our followers. We've seen our shareholder base completely, just about completely turn over. We have so many um, great loyal followers uh, on different bulletin boards who are frankly making a difference. Um, and, you know, I, I want to acknowledge just how important those folks are. And this is not just, you know, you know, localized, you know, in Canada, it's, it's all over the country in, in the US. We've got um, even in Germany, even in Germany, you got big fans. Yeah, right? just, just exactly took the words out of my mouth. Germany, are, I'm so impressed. Um, there are two large um, bulletin board groups over there um, that I'm aware of that I'm in dialogue with every now and then. And they're tremendously supportive and, and they let me know. And even in kind of the challenging times, you know, before we got the audit behind us and, you know, there was reason for uh, trepidation and complaint. I had so many positive messages come in from our groups who, you know what, they're, they're not here to sell at this point in time. And 
Um, you know, I, like, I, I can't, you know, force people to, to sell or to buy or do or hold whatever they want to do. But um, I just know where we are and where we're going. And I think in the recent run-ups that we saw, the heavy run-ups in price, we got to a market cap and, and trading multiple uh, and the market was comfortable with us there. Like, and it, it reminded me that the path that we're on, uh, we deserve those types of multiples in the future or, or to, you know, play at that level in terms of market cap. I think, I think we comfortably deserve it. I think we're comfortable with our own identity at that, those levels. And then that will, you know, just, we'll see where it all goes from there. Right. But to your point, we've got tremendous investment banking support so that, you know, when the time is right um, and we think it's you know, time to do something else um, to build more of a war chest, then we'll do that. Um, as you know, I think, again, we at some point will be deserving of of an uplist. Uh, and I really think that we have the technical chops to get it done. Um, and I think that we have the precision um, to get through it. We obviously got to uh, button up our um, accounting um, uh, processes uh, in order for that to happen. But uh, we've got ourselves a game plan now that, like I said earlier, that we'll, I'll give everybody some announcements here in the near future on. Well, everything you just said, I can summarize as something I've been saying online for the last three, four months through all everything, which is Steve doesn't know how to play small ball. You've been trained in environments at General Electric and other places where you only know how to play big, big ball at the end of the day. We have to. What's the point otherwise? <laughs> let's, you know, let's, we've got an opportunity together. Um, we've got momentum. We, you know, we, we must just maintain that momentum. And you know, I'm hungry. I've, I've got tons of energy. So, you know, let's, let's make sure that we're working smart, not just hard. And I've got some good people around me who are really helping remind us the importance of working smart also. Um, we put in the hours, so nobody should ever doubt that, uh, but we also need to have tremendous precision. Um, it's competitive out there and we're going to be competing for the best people and the best opportunities and transactions. And I think we'll, we'll get our fair share. Steve, congratulations on getting this uh, over, the, over the hump. But at the Thank same time, I think more important for everybody at home, you lived up to your word. And in the meantime, you didn't allow BizDev to suffer in any, uh, in any way. In fact, it seems like uh, you've got big plans and you've got big things to tell us. So congrats on behalf of everybody. I think I can speak on behalf of everybody. And last word to you on, uh, even though I think you've said, you've said pretty much everything to say, any last words I'm going to leave to you? No, just a, again, a thank you um, to, to our followers and to, to all our, uh, you know, our team members. Uh, they, you know, we've, we're really, you know, I think we're putting together a really special culture. Um, you know, it's, it's a culture that's based on inclusiveness, on transparency, on diversity. And, uh, you know, it's an such an intriguing sector. Healthcare is just has, has evolved so much in the last, you know, 12 to 16 months with the pandemic, it's created opportunity, you know, boundless opportunity. And I think that we have found our positioning. Uh, and so it's on us now to execute. And I, I think it's going to be a very exciting, you know, next, I'm just thinking all the way through to like, you know, 2024, you know, what is this going to look like then? I mean, I can't, uh, you know, even well, healthcare is going to go on a rocket ride because this whole oh, yeah. pandemic has forced us to rethink how we do things, how we incorporate technology. Uh, and that's, and that's the advantage of nimble, smaller companies that can power that can, that can adapt and move super fast. And it sounds yeah, like that's what absolutely. you're doing. Man. And that, that's exactly what's, what's happened. Um, but not without a lot of work and uh, thoughtfulness um, and execution but I think we've got, you know, I think we've got the ingredients to do it and we're committed and we're going to just keep on moving and keep on growing. Well, it looks like it, Steve, you, you look re-energized, you sound re-energized because you're really, in a, you know, we knew you're in the front lines there for a while and you did great with those videos and people could see that, hey, you were, you were, you were grinding, you're exhausted, but you, it took a toll on you. But now uh, it's after audit and you look, you look and sound reinvigorated. So I can't wait to see what's going to happen in the next 60 days. 
next six months and next 24 months because this is going to be one hell of a ride, I think. Yeah, great, George. Thank you. Listen, thank you for getting me on the show again. No problem, buddy. We can't wait to have you back. But for everybody at home, you've been watching or if you've been listening by podcast on Spotify, Google, Apple, your favorite podcast platform, to the one and only Steve McCauley, CEO of Empower Clinics, CBDT in Canada, EPWCF in the US, and of course, for our great, great fans in Germany, 8EC on Frankfurt. Do your due diligence. Most importantly, keep watch because it sounds like Steve's going to have a lot to say. Empower's going to have a lot to say in the coming uh, days and weeks and months. Glad to have it back. Thanks for joining us. Have a great day. See you next time. Hey guys, this video is over, but don't forget to help your company by liking it and then leaving a comment below. And then don't forget to help yourself by subscribing to our channel so you don't ever miss another great Agoracom small cap video.